to uh, give a talk on the implications of biofuels policy in Thailand and water. Uh, this presentation was initially made last year at the Global Bioenergy Partnership meeting. They had invited me to come on their activity group on water. So they asked me to share some experiences from Thailand. And we've been working with water for the last, I think, five years or so. Uh, we've done some research projects as well as there's a PhD student here who's working on water. There. So, okay. So, as all of you are probably aware already that uh, by the, uh, the Thai government has got pretty aggressive targets of, on biofuels and very tiny too, I must say. So, the caveat is that the numbers presented here were from the time I made the presentation. They might have changed a bit, but the general idea remains still the same. So, if you look at the ethanol demand, that's about 9 million liters per day by uh, 2021. So I think in 2012 or 13, we had about 3 million liters per day. And for the biodiesel demand, it's about 6 million liters per day. And then there are other biofuels, alternatives to diesel, etc., which we will not uh, consider today because my talk is focused only on ethanol and biodiesel. So you know that biofuels have been promoted with a view to using local resources, reduce uh, dependence on external uh, fuel feedstocks, uh, save some uh, import to the foreign exchange, and also uh, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So in all this talk about greenhouse gas emissions, somehow I think water was kind of sideline and water is a very very important resource we have enough water in the world even if we talk about fresh water we have enough fresh water in the world so that is not the problem the quantity is not the problem but the availability is a problem because it is not equitably distributed we don't have it where we need it necessarily and when we need it so the time and space factor is actually very very important vis-a-vis -vis water even though in quantity wise we have enough. So uh, what we did in this particular project was to look at the so-called crop water requirement. So I've given you the equations over there, but let's not get lost in equations. Basically, crops require water because they evapotranspire, okay, evaporation and transpiration. Part of this is provided by rainfall and the remaining could be provided by irrigation. So we are focused more on the water that we need for irrigation because for that we use freshwater resources from the river, lakes, from the groundwater, etc. So what we have defined over here, this water deficit is actually the difference between the crop water requirement and the rainfall. So this is what we provide by water and sometimes we, it has been called uh, blue water, but I don't particularly prefer the term. But that's what it is, and the rainwater is called green water. But, okay, these are old definitions. They have been traditionally there, but we are trying to phase them out. The issue with water is that, as we know, water is not equitably distributed. So a cubic meter of water in Kongtan province does not have the same value as a resource as a cubic meter of water in Krabi. Because in Krabi, maybe we have 250 days of rainfall, whereas in Komken or uh, other provinces in the northeast, probably much less. So what we do is, we look at the water deprivation, which is this water deficit, which is the irrigation water required, multiplied by a so-called stress index. WSI is the water stress index. Now this concrete formula is there, but in very simple words, what this formula is trying to do is correlate the withdrawal of water to the availability of water. So if we have a lot of water available and we withdraw some, the stress is low. But if we have less availability of water and we withdraw quite a bit, then the stress is high. So that's, in a nutshell, the significance of the term 
WSI, that's what it says. And then this fancy equation is there just to make a logistic curve out of it. So what we do is the water deprivation is defined as this irrigation water requirement multiplied by this, let's say, withdrawal to availability ratio. Now, we did this exercise for the 25 watersheds in Thailand to find out the water stress indices of the various watersheds. Now, normally, uh, in many of the international for, uh, studies, Thailand is just taken as one single unit. And in that, in that case, if you see, most parts of Thailand do not have a stress situation. So when you average things out, Thailand does not have a water stress issue at all. And that's what we see. However, if we look at the different watersheds, because the watersheds is actually the natural hydrological boundary, then we see that, yes, it's true that many provinces in Thailand, you can see all these light yellow ones, they have very less, very low water stress. But there are certain provinces, if you look here, in the center of Thailand, number 10 is the Chao Phraya Basin, and number 13 is the Thachin Basin. And then you have this number 16, which is the West Coast Gulf, or number 8, this is the Chi Basin. And of course then the, the very dark one, the extreme stress one, that is the Moon Basin in the northeast of Thailand. So it does not, it does really matter where we are looking at in Thailand to do that whether there is water stress or not. And this is something that we will need when we are talking about expanding crops to uh, facilitate the expansion of biofilms in Thailand. Now, initially the policy was that for the sour and sugar cane, which are the feedstocks for ethanol, there is supposed to be no change in land. That has recently been altered by the new policy. However, this study was done with the intention that okay, there is going to be no, the, the area under sugar cane and the sour cultivation is fixed, whereas the oil pump will expand because that was the government policy. So let's first look at what what uh, we have with bioethanol or ethanol. So when you look at the water deprivation from expansion, so expansion in Thailand for bioethanol, so first of all there are three, mainly two feedstocks, I would say cassava and sugar cane, but usually we are not producing ethanol from sugar cane juice directly, rather from the molasses that remain after we extract the sugar from the sugar cane juice and cassava. Okay, so there are 48 registered bioethanol plants in Thailand and they are spread over 26 provinces left over 30 watersheds. Now since we are looking at the policy, we will look at all the 48 registered bioethanol plants in Thailand and see how that demands on water. So now, okay, if you look at the life cycle, there you have sugarcane cultivation which has a very deep water demand and then you have okay, the sugarcane which is built we have some demand in the sugar factory as well. And then the molasses are converted to ethanol. This process also requires water. Or we could have taken directly the sugar cane juice and fermented that to ethanol. That is the easier way actually. And then there is cassava which has to be hydrolyzed and then converted to ethanol. So here once again cassava cultivation has the big demand on water. And then we have the ethanol conversion which also requires water. <coughs> So when we look at the comparative water, so-called water footprints, actually now we don't use that term anymore according to ISO, but in this presentation I will still continue using that. So here we see that if you look at the cassava, now we have to focus on the blue part because the green part is the one coming from rain, but the blue part is the one that we are, is creating the stress on the water resources, stress on the rivers or on the groundwater and other surface water, other surface water sources. So here you see that there is quite a big difference between the, well, not a very big difference, but there is some a substantial difference between the various regions that is because of the different climatic conditions, soil conditions, etc. And then you have this, this directly from the sugar cane and this from the molasses. So you see that the molasses has actually the biggest demand in terms of water. So you have about 600, 700 liters of water per liter of bioethanol as compared to about 500 for cassava and 520, 30 for cassava and 490 for sugar cane. However, when you look at this particular graph, 
to see which parts of the life cycle have the biggest demand on the water, then you see that about 97 to 98% of the water demand is coming from cultivation as we would expect. So that is the area where we have to focus if we have to conserve water resources. So now when we look at this various situations now, we look at two scenarios. One is the policy mandate scenario where we say that okay by 2021 we will have the 9 million liters of uh, ethanol per day. Now this is below the capa actual capacity of the plant, so we made another scenario which is the full production capacity scenario where we assume that the plants will operate according, if they were to operate according to the full capacity, how much uh, water would be required. So now there are a lot of numbers in this uh, table which is difficult to follow, but if we focus here on the two things that are marked in the red, with the red boxes, here we see that this 1,600 million cubic meters per day of uh, per year of water are required if we are to meet the 2021 target of the government for ethanol. Whereas if the plants were operating, all, all of them were operating according to full capacity, then we would have about 2,200 million cubic meters of water a year would be required. So this is this can be a substantial effect on uh, uh, water competition because there are also other uses of water such as livestock industry, domestic uses and so on. And what with the situation when water is not coming all the year round, but we have season of we have the dry season and the wet season, this can be particularly exacerbated based on the cultivation cycle of the cassava or the, or the sugar cane and so on. Here, then we have distributed according to all the watersheds in which the feedstocks are being grown. So if you just look at the water volume, then the moon basin shares about one third of the total water requirements. The next one is the chi basin, which is with about 14%, and then you have the prachi Muri basin, 13%. But it's just based on the volume of water that is required. Whereas if you correlate that with the availability of the water, if you remember the 35 watersheds that I showed you, in that I had marked two watersheds, the moon and the chi basin especially, because they had very high water stress already. And when we convert that water, volumetric water requirement to the water deprivation by including the stress component, then you see that moon from 33% has become 73% because it is very highly stressed. So it's even more exaggerated. And the sheet from 14% has become 16%. Whereas the Prachin Muri, which was very, very low in terms of water stress, goes down from 13% to only about 1%. So this is giving us an idea as to where the expansion of the Sawa or Sugar King, if at all, could take place or should take place to reduce the impact on water stress. So, I mean, I'm, I'm showing a very uh, <coughs> general picture over here, but we have more details uh, based on the GIS maps, etc., et cetera, showing the exact location where the plantations could be promoted. So, uh, to kind of summarize this part of the discussion, uh, crop watering about well, transpiration reduction can be very, very important. So that means we reduce the amount of water that is required by the crops. And this can be done by developing crop varieties that are drought tolerant, they have a high yield and a short growth period. So they have a shorter cropping cycle, so they use less water. And then, of course, improving the agricultural practices using good agricultural practices. And promotion of sugarcane ethanol. Notice in the previous uh, table that sugarcane ethanol requires much lesser, lesser water than cassava or molasses ethanol. So if you promote ethanol production from sugarcane juice, that would have that would also uh, result in water savings. And then of course enhancing the water use efficiency in feedstock processing, 
We have seen that feedstock processing itself contributes less to the overall water, but nevertheless, in terms of blue water or the surface water requirement, it is an important contributor. And promoting the bioethanol feedstock cultivation in low water stress areas. So since we already know which areas are water stressed, so we try to reduce their contribution to the expansion of crops, feedstock of crops for uh, ethanol production. So this is the story about uh, ethanol. Now if you look at biodiesel. For biodiesel, this is we are divided into three regions falling under the 13 under 13 watersheds. So we have the eastern region, the central region, and the southern region. I mean all of us know that the southern region is the hotbed of uh, palm palm oil uh, oil palm cultivation. Now all the Biodiesel in Thailand is produced from palm oil. There is no other feedstock currently from which palm oil is, uh, biodiesel is produced. So if you look at that now, here we looked at two kinds of boundaries. One is the hydrological boundary of the watershed and the administrative boundary, simply because data, data is available in terms of administrative boundaries, but water flows according to the hydrological boundaries. So here, now this is kind of the biodiesel production system. So we have the oil palm plantation and then the fresh food bunches are produced which go to the palm mill. Then we have the main product from this is the crude palm oil. And then you have the kernel, shell, fiber, palm oil being effluent which is the wastewater coming out. That also can produce biogas which is an important energy source. We have the empty fruit bunches that is the bunch, this bunch that remains after we extract the oil from it and the and the day and so on. So this crude palm oil is then further processed, which is transesterified using ethanol and a catalyst to produce biodiesel. So here you see the cultivation, once again cultivation is a very important one, it's more than 99% of the fresh water for the whole biodiesel chain is coming only from cultivation. You can see for all the regions, central, east as well as south, more than 99%. Up to 99.9 percent is coming from uh, feedstock cultivation only because palm especially requires a lot of water. It's 13,000 cubic meter per hectare per year, and palm is a tree, so it's kind of going for a long period of time and it keeps getting water, which is why it grows very well in the south of Thailand, which has a lot of rainfall. However, with the policy of expanding the oil palm, <laughs> oil palm is present in I don't know how many. 16? How many provinces? <laughs> 16, right? Uh, surprisingly, about almost 60, 60 out of 77 provinces in Thailand have oil palm cultivation, which is kind of, uh, if I may put it uh, less politely, ridiculous. But it's there. So, we have farm in the center of Thailand. We have farm even in the northeast of Thailand. Yeah. Now the center of Thailand has a high palm, uh, high water demand, but it's good for oil palm in the sense that okay, there are abandoned rice fields, etc., or, or abandoned orchards actually, which have acidic soil and we cannot plant other things on it. Oil palm can be planted. And the center of Thailand, because of the rice bowl of Thailand, it has a very good irrigation system, so we can provide water. However, you can see that the center is not a very good, in terms of water, center is not a very good place to uh, region to plant oil palm. Uh, but the southern region, as we know from conventional wisdom also, is a better place for oil palm and our results show something similar. So here we took three scenarios because the government has already announced that they want to expand. We said, let's assume that all the expanded oil palm areas are in the east of Thailand or all of them in the center of Thailand or all of them in the south of Thailand. That's one scenario. <coughs> and another scenario we said, okay, we will expand, we will distribute the oil palm expansion based on the current oil palm plantation. So uh, on the available areas in the country. So 79% in the south, 18% in the east, and 3% in the central region. So here, when we look at the water requirement, you 
focus again on the blue or the irrigation water, we see that the south has the lowest water, volumetric water requirement. If we add up all the water that is required over the many years until 2021. Whereas the east and the center have higher water requirement. And if we spread the plantations according to the availability of land, and we say 79% in the south, 18% in the east, and 3% in the center, then this value is lower than planting totally in the east or in the center. But this is the total volumetric water requirement. If we again correlate this with the availability of water to get the water stress, then the situation is slightly different. Here you see the east has the lowest water demand. The south and the combined have similar water demands and the center is very high. Because the center is already very stressed in terms of water because the demands are very high. And then we kind of did a little bit of a sensitivity kind of studies where we keep changing the percentages to see how much lower than this uh, 87 can we go. So we went down to 79, almost until 76 million cubic meters of what it will be to a So what are the recommendations that come out from this study now? Of course, once again, I, I need to say that there are more details behind this. We know exactly where the oil palm plantations should be done, which I have not shown every detail over here. So the efficiency of water use in the plantation depends on how well farmers meet the good agriculture practice standards. So this is something very, very important. And it comes out again and again in all the kind of agriculture studies that we do, that I mean, the good practice, agricultural practices exist but they are not followed. So that means we need a very good extension system, uh, agriculture extension system, to promote the use of good agricultural practices. Starting first from using good variety, good seed. Because farmers can take, sometimes just take to use any kinds of varieties without really focusing on high eating varieties or drought resistant varieties. And this is sometimes a problem. The other thing is application of fertilizers. A lot of times for so many crops we have seen on the field that farmers apply fertilizers based on how much money they have. If they have more for money, they have put more fertilizers, if they have less, they put less. I know it's a it's an economic problem and it's a real problem on the field, but at times you might be putting too much in it. So that's a bit ironical. Considering that uh, as it is they have less money and then they are putting more than the requirements simply because we are not measuring the requirements. The oil farm, for example, we need to do a soil and leaf analysis. Malaysia, example, for example, they have large plantations, so the companies own them, so they are doing this soil and leaf analysis before deciding how much potassium, etc. to add. But that is less practice here, and this is probably a problem. And here, putting, in, uh, putting the varieties that have high oil yields that are tolerant of drought, these can help do so water. And then we have to shift the expansion away from the center, probably towards the east or maybe in the south. So we have identified actually the GIS, which areas we should possibly plant these to reduce the stress impacts on the on So I think I've used up my 20 minutes or so of presentation. So this is all I have to share for now, but if you have other discussion points, I'm very happy. Thank you, Dan. So, yeah. so, if anyone have any comments or point uh, to share with the interview or any discussion, please. Yeah. Okay, it's like that. Ah, then make it up. The traditional planting of the products was promoted by the government or was it just by accident? It was traditionally there. How did it develop to come to this kind of stage of distribution of planting this environment? You mean for the oil palm? Yeah. Well, as I understand, the previously many years ago, maybe 50 years ago or so, animal facts, etc., were used for uh, 
as a medium for cooking. And this slowly started to change. And then oil palm was first introduced about 25 or 40 years ago. And since the South was very congenial to oil palm, they were planted over there. The, for the biodiesel, this has come much later, so the last 10, 10, 15 years or so. So that is how the oil palm thing has been decided. And then there was this, in the South there are two major crops, one is oil palm and one is rubber. So and the world prices keep fluctuating, so sometimes farmers say, oh the wrong price side, let's cut oil palm and rubber, or vice versa. But as you know that these are trees, you don't get the result overnight or, or even in a year. You have to wait at least three years, we have gestation period before the palm starts to eat, and that is not the highest peak. So by that time the price changes, etc. So these kind of complicated mechanisms are there. And then we started to expand more in the other areas when the biodiesel policy became kind of firmly established. And people sort of wow, okay, the government is actually promoting biodiesel in this way. Let's plant oil palm with all things are not going to do. Something like this. But that was this was not promoted by the government that okay, let's plant in the northeast or something like this. This is more kind of, I would say, personal initiatives. Can tell you you show the um, the video SI, what is that what the stress what is the stress? Yeah. And it seemed that in the south of northeast part of Norwegian is quite high, extreme. Yes. It is that because, what you said it's because the, uh, it's the relatives between what the availability and the amounts of water withdrawal. That's right. So it's because of what the availability is less or you have you use more water in that area? <laughs> that's, that's a relative question. <laughs> that's a relative question. I think it's a little bit of both. It's a little bit of both. There's a lot of rice grown which has quite high water demand. And then you know that in the in the that in that area there is a very distinct dry season. But still the agriculture is there, even in that season. That is my, my area, my hometown. <laughs> <laughs> you, you can you can tell me better. <laughs> but that, that part of the east, not is the relative may have the more precipitation than than other areas. But this cassava planting area, very, very intensive uh, cassava cultivation. And, and because you asked this question, I think we should also mention that what we did in the first pass was kind of an annual average kind of study, which is not reflecting the true situation also in a way. So now actually we have just finished another study where we are looking at the water stress index not for the whole year, but for every month for the seasons, for wet season and dry season. And the results are very, very astounding. They change quite, quite a lot from the annual study. Okay, so because you also use the KC, KC also varies yes. very much on, on a, day, a daily basis or a seasonal cultivation. I mean, that, for example, in the, um, during certain states of that growth, the KC would be very high and other would be very low. So if you could like, consider this in more detail, I think it would be very, very um, targeted to, to the um, user labor, the farm or farm labor. Well, thank you very much. Yes, that's a very important point. And the, the whole idea behind this monthly kind of study is to kind of match the crops cultivation cycle with the water availability to reduce the stress flow. Yeah, absolutely correct. Any other comments? Okay, so time is well, almost <laughs> up. So, well, Adam Javier, thank you very much for sharing these um, findings and all these results with us. Okay, thank you again.